Welcome to this panel. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, my name's Andrew. I'm from the Freshly Charged channel. I review all sorts of personal electric vehicles, so I'm excited to be here. We have some amazing guests here today. We'll start out from the left, introducing to the right. Um, Dong from Rivet, which is an awesome motorcycle company, e-motorcycles, which I'm excited to test out today as well. Uh, we have the team captain from Turn, which makes amazing mid-drive bikes. And I don't think you guys even make hub drive motors, right? So they're, they're all mid-drive? Not yet. Not yet, which is perfectly fine. Mid-drive motors to me are by far the best e-bikes out there. So, and then we have Taylor from a brand new company. So that's uh, from BikeWise, which sounds like a pretty sweet idea. Um, it's more about finding accessories for what works with different bikes. And I think it's a huge need in this community. Um, and you can just check it out. So then we have Richard from Troxus, which is a, an e-bike company here. And then also James, who's from um, Sol, is it Soleil? Soleil. Soleil Bicycles. And they're just new to the e-bike space. They've been making bikes for a long time. Their new bike looks really sweet. Uh, it's kind of like um, almost like a BMX style e-bike and comes in really funky colors. So I love that. Good, good way to express yourself. But we're in a, an emerging environment. It's been fun for me. The drastic growth that we've seen in the micro mobility space has been pretty sweet over the past few years. COVID helped a ton. I loved seeing what happened during COVID is in America, people got their stimulus checks and they were not doing anything besides sitting at home. And the micro mobility space saw a huge boost. Um, cells went through the roof for people. People got out and they enjoyed the air. And a um, great way for people to kind of get out there. So we'll just start this panel off by asking some questions about the retail space. It's ever evolving and um, direct to consumer is huge now in 2023. So I, I kind of want to go around and ask everybody's opinion of what's the best way that they've been able to target people with the direct to consumer market. So we'll we'll start out with Dong over there. All right. Hey, how's it going? So <clears throat> we're... Um a light electric vehicle company. Our first product happens to be a road legal DLT motorcycle. Uh, that puts us in, in a, an interesting place because we want to do direct to consumer. However, it's a lot more complicated when it's a product like a motorcycle, right? You, you have to have people that are properly trained, properly licensed. Uh, right. The service is a little bit more difficult, right? So how do we reach customers without a dealership? How do we go around and, and train people how to ride, let them demo our product. We have some demos out there, by the way, if you're licensed. Um, the way we look at retail and direct-to-consumer is a hybrid approach, right? We want to reach our customers, get get them to be familiar with our product, our brand, get them their bike, but then immediately after that, really train them how to use the product, how to service the product, and then partner with local entities, not dealerships, just local places, local retail shops to help them get demos out, help them get riders on seats and, uh, and properly train them how to ride a motorcycle. Right. So that's, that's how we're going about it. Yeah. And we'll head over to you, Josh, which, what's, what's your guys' take on the retail market and direct to consumers? Well, for us, I think Dong said it really well, right? You, that service component is key, right? Electric vehicles are complicated. Ideally, they're meant to be used daily for for recreation or transportation. And so you have to have service. So for us, that's kind of like you have to have that. So DDC, you need to think about whether you or not you can you can service the product that you sell. Right? So uh, I was just talking to Richard, but uh president of a company years ago said to me, the day you sell an e-bike is day one and you need to be prepared to have a relationship with that customer for 10 years. And if you're not prepared for that, don't get into e-bikes. And I think the D to C right, model, what is the service? Right? What's the service component? How are you going to handle that? I think a lot of consumers don't think about that when they're buying it. But I think we're seeing in the market, well, bad things happen when you don't have the service component. I have nobody to service it. You know, I have to send it back. I mean, so for us, it's always 
how do we service that? Because you have to have local service. So that's how we think about it. I love that we're focusing so much on the service side. Um, because <laughs> at BikeWise, what we've built, um, and today's a big day, it's our launch. So we, we've been around since, since February and just, just launched today, um, a compatibility engine for, for bicycles and then eventually the broader micro mobility, um, broader micro, micro mobility vehicles. Um, so what that means is when it does come time for servicing, that we make it really easy for consumers to find the part that's best for their bike, not only fits their bike, which can be a challenge across different OEMs, but what's best for their riding habits. Um, what are you optimizing for? Is it speed? Is it safety? Is it longevity? Um, and what's going to give you the best riding experience? And so that's what we've done by partnering with retailers to give them this data um, and this compatibility engine. Uh, we're helping to empower them to educate their customers um, on how they can how they can maintain their bikes long term for that 10 plus year relationship. I'm not going to disagree. Well, I'm not going to disagree with anybody up here, but I'm going to maybe be a bit more emphatic. I think you have to look at an ecosystem. And that's what we're building is an ecosystem for human mobility. And if you don't start with the end in mind, meaning that bike is going to, or scooter or whatever mobility device you choose to sell that person, if you do not have the infrastructure to support that, you're doing the whole movement a disservice. Because what happens when somebody invests, let's say for a low end direct to consumer e-bike is a thousand dollars. It's still a thousand dollars. And if they've only had that bike for six months and they have a problem and they can't get that taken care of, how do they feel about the space? Okay, they're going to hate the brand, but how are they going to feel about the space? How are they going to feel about their investment? Are they going to believe in what we're trying to provide to them as a solution for, you know, larger mechanized transport? So, you know, I, I started pushing a broom in a bike shop in 1981. And I've seen different alternative strategies be deployed to try to get direct to the consumer, to try to cut out margin, to try to you know ratchet profitability out of everybody in the supply chain. And every time that happens, we have a backlash. And you know, if I've probably visited close to 200 dealers in the last 30 days, and it all comes down to I've got a bunch of people who are upset, who can't ride their bike because they bought it online and I can't get parts for it. So I think we all have to be very, very conscious of the fact that, and to Josh's point, you know, we're buying and we're, that consumer is investing in you and your brand for the long term. And if we don't take care of them, it's going to do us all a disservice. Um. So we, we started our brand back in 2010 and we weren't in the e-bike space. We were uh, the leisure bike space. So single speed, fixed gear style bikes and leisure style bikes. Um, like you said, they're very colorful and beautiful and simplistic. Um, and so we were actually one of the first 1000 people on uh, companies on Shopify. So we were a direct first brand. And um, so we have a ton of experience in that space selling direct to consumer. You know, we've scaled our business, spending a ton in paid media and going that route. But we found that if you rely on paid media, you know, it's it's a it's a variable cost. And, you you know, your CPMs can change on a month to month basis. So it's a super challenging way to scale, um, scale your business. But what we found and we did a study on attribution, you know, from our customers over a 10 year period and 40 percent of our sales came from friends and family or referrals. So we've developed a really strong affiliate program and, you know, a, a way for our customers to go out and be ambassadors for our business and, and, and get a kickback on it. Um, so, so a really, really strong affiliate program has helped us scale our business. And, and then to the service point too, the guys that, uh, the guys that guys and gals at Beeline have been a really great partner for us as a direct to consumer brand, right? You know, Beeline is, uh, if you guys aren't familiar it's a, it's a service that allows us as, as a direct-to-consumer brand to plug into 2,000 bike shops across you know, America and Canada. And so when a consumer goes on our site, not only can they you know, pick a local bike shop that they can have their bike shipped to and professionally built, uh, but then also you know, 
find the local service center to to service our product so that you know if there is an issue that comes from us as a direct uh, direct to consumer brand they have a place to go locally to service it amazing thank you guys for all your insight um, some things that came to mind when I was listening to all those answers was customer service is a huge thing going on right now. Um, e-bikes, anything in electric mobility, it gets a little bit more tricky for like a motorcycle. Motorcycles are, they use a lot of the similar components, but at the same time, there's almost every single one of these e-devices. They're pretty simplistic, but also complex. So there's a controller. That's a lot of times controllers go bad and they're, a lot of times they could be plug and play. Uh, motors will go bad, but they're not as dynamic as most people think. There's a battery too that's involved with it. And I find that a lot of local like mechanical bike shops, mechanical motorcycle shops don't really want to touch electric devices because they feel like it's abnormal. But what's that education piece for those people to actually start servicing these things for you guys? Like, how do you guys get involved with the local retailers to help service it when it's not really too complicated, but they overcomplicate it? I'll start. This is a, a question that's really dear to, our, to us as a company, right? So when we started Rivet, we, we knew that there was going to be an adoption curve, right? Not everyone's going to know what an electric motorcycle really is or an EV in general. So we took the approach of, okay, let's, let's work with what's out there. Let's simplify our product as much as we can from a manufacturing standpoint, all the way to a end of life and, and service standpoint. Uh, that includes working with local shops that work on existing motorcycles, right? They don't want to, they have no idea what these big hub motors are on some of these electric motorcycles. They don't even want to touch it. So we, we chose to go mid drive very early on for that reason to simplify how do you balance a rear tire, right? You can't balance a hub motor and you can't change your tires without unplugging it from the controller, right? So we separated all of our, our components, including our batteries. Our batteries are removable uh, without tools, meaning if something went wrong with your battery, you can ship it back to us and we'll ship you a new battery. If we come out with new battery in the future, we can actually just swap it out and give you a whole new, dip, new battery for the same vehicle. Um, our controller can be removed with four fasteners and it can be swapped out, like you said, with any of the same controllers, right? We, we have a, an ecosystem of battery, controller, and motor that works very well together, but they're all, they're all software in the loop systems. So that means we have the ability to go IoT and, and actually diagnose these vehicles over the air, which only leaves the mechanical components to the shops. All they're doing is tire changes, brake pads, like every other motorcycle. The EV component we separated out for for us to deal with, direct to the consumer. Anyone else? I'll, I'll take the next. I mean, I think when you design your products, you have to think about what suppliers you choose, what vendors do you choose. And that's that's a key thing, right? Because that's part of the hey, ten years out, will that vendor still be in business? Will they still be responsible? Right. So we chose Bosch. And so if you if you have a turn bike using a Bosch and you're across the country, you can walk into any shop. There are literally thousands of shops that, that handle Bosch. You can get a replacement display, a battery, a motor swap, and it happens easily. But beyond just the electric system, it's you know, it's it's everything else out there, right? You know, what kind of seat post do you use, stem, handlebar, tires, all of those things we think about, right? If it's proprietary. We need to keep it in stock, which is an expense, and we need to keep it in stock for 10 years. And so we, when we come to a point where, hey, do we go proprietary or do we go standard, that's a big decision point, right? So we have to have really, really good reasons to go proprietary because, uh, right, 10 years holding stock, that's, that's terrible. So those are all things that we think about, and, you know, I, I think, you know, Bosch, obviously, as a standard that has invested in training and servicing in thousands of bike shops, that gives you a huge advantage. I know whenever we do a a, a, a development on a new product, you know, again, to Josh's point, you know, you have your choice of maybe four or five battery suppliers. You have your choice of four or five controller suppliers, motor suppliers, et cetera. And... 
we are very, very clear that we only partner with people who have domestic service centers for their components. So like Josh said, Bosch, for instance, or the Fong or et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, it, again, it's, it's, it's that planning for the long run and making sure you're going to be able to take care of that person and get those replacement parts to them when they need them and how they need them. Yeah, we're, we're newer in the space, but, you know, our advisors and the people we spoke to, this was the the biggest thing we wanted to focus on. And, and, and one project we're working on with a company out of um, that's really larger in Europe and hasn't quite entered the U.S. market yet is, is Onanda. And, and the tech that we're working on with them is um, a diagnostics tool that's an app that actually will install on the consumer's phone. Right. So you imagine when when your car has an issue, you plug in a, a d diagnostics device and it reads back the codes. Well, similar concept. There's going to be a Bluetooth mechanism that the consumer can then put that put their phone towards their bike. If there's an issue and read back r code readings with the goal of, you know, closing the gap on trying to isolate what are those issues and make that experience not only better for the consumer, but also the service shop that's going in to work on this product, right? Is it something we can handle there in shop or do we need to actually send replacement parts? So it's something we're thinking about and trying to leverage the tech to really close that gap. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly my stance is it's about empowering the mechanics on the diagnostic stage, which I think tech can, can certainly be used for, but then also once they know what the problem is, knowing that they can, you know, get the right materials and tools and and parts to to make that repair. So so that's I mean where where I think compatibility comes in, um, particularly ensuring that um, you know, as the, the the industry scales, so does the need for mechanics. Therefore there are a lot of new mechanics entering into entering into this space. And they the original question was around like how do we avoid them turning our bikes away as if they have the confidence that they can do the job and do the job well because their reputation depends on it. So empowering them with the tools, the software, the tech that they need uh, to feel confident in, in doing that repair. Awesome. Thank you guys for a lot of insight. And for me, it, it's been awesome to kind of see this industry progress. Um, back in the day, e-bikes three years ago, a lot of the components were in plug and play. So if you had to ever replace a, uh, electric brake line or replace a throttle, you had to wire the whole thing all the way back to the controller. And it was kind of a mess for a consumer. Now, most things are plug and play where you can release them closer to the, closer to where the component is. So you don't really have to mess around with a lot of things with like the motorcycles with rivet. The problem with plug and play devices is you lose power between them. So I could see that being an issue for you guys. Have you found any way to resolve that? Or have you just found putting thicker gauge wires to compensate? Yeah, so we, we have a central um, wiring harness that's pretty flexible. Everything is removed in a central location. Uh, we really believe in, in right to repair. A lot of motorcycle companies, they kind of lock everything down. We're the exact opposite. We keep everything as, as open source as possible. We even provide um, where our suppliers are to some components so you can actually get it yourself. We're, we're, we're willing to really work with the consumer because we realize this is a new market, right? People are already kind of taking the jump to a whole different type of vehicle. We didn't want them to have to also take the jump on being a bit risk. Right? We're a new company, so we want to make sure that people have the ability to work on their own product. Awesome. And he brought up something that kind of rings a bell in this industry, the right to repair. And if you guys don't know what's going on with that is some companies will lock down everything that if you ever need to get something repaired, you have to send them back to wherever it was made. Um, and a lot of people have issues with that, but I also see there's some liability issues with letting people repair things that don't know what they're doing. So this is another good topic about legality of fixing things and leaving it up to consumers who don't really know electrical, don't know certain things, start, mod start modifying batteries, and we're starting to see lithium fires become a huge issue in the space. So do you cap some things that people can modify, or do you leave it all open? No, that's safety is always going to be a big issue, right? So you, you don't... Um... When we say uh, right to repair, it means we have uh, documentation 
to allow people to kind of learn how to repair certain things. Our BMS uh, controller, um, our drive system is, is very uh, unique to the company. And, and also there's a lot of safeties because our battery is 4.3 kilowatt, right? It's not, not like a typical e-bike battery. This, this will burn your house down. So there's a lot of safety uh, protocols that we have to follow from our BMS development and also what the customer really have access to. We, we implore a 72 volt system. So it's lower than the, the typical bigger EVs, um, which means you don't need special licenses to really work on the system. Like if you go to a, a mechanic, they can work on your bike without having to have a high voltage uh, license, right? So um, that allows us to let people work on their bike from a mechanical standpoint. But if, if your battery breaks, you call us and we'll tell you exactly what's wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah, the amount of power in a 500 watt hour battery, if my math is correct, is equivalent to six hand grenades. Right? So you don't want a consumer who doesn't know how to change a tire messing around with a battery. Uh, the construction of a battery is incredibly complex. If you a, a weld is slightly off or the ceiling is slightly off, you have big problems. So yeah, I, you, you should absolutely be able to get your bicycle repaired, but you have to have the expertise. And our position is that when it comes to batteries, yeah, you don't want to mess around. Yeah, s send it back to Bosch. Let the professionals figure it out. Anyone else have any insight on that? Or I know you're new to the space, so. I mean, I'm in, I'm in the same boat. I mean, yeah, we're from, a, you know, when we designed our first bike, right, we wanted to make something really simple. So, you know, the battery is removable and we have a rear rear hub mo motor outside of that, right? It's just, yeah, a, a 24 inch BMX style bike. So really like if there's an issue with the motor or battery, we, we're going to handle that. Outside of that, it's a bike, a normal bike shop should be able to handle everything else. It's all about modularity and plug and play, like you were saying. You know, we don't have the, you know, the amperage loss and things like that by having to wire it in and just, you know, don't touch the batter, don't touch the controller, unplug the piece, send it back to us. If we can fix it, we'll fix it. Otherwise, we'll send you a new one. We see a lot of regulations, I think, coming in for charging at home, right? What kind of battery is allowed to wear? Because uh, our battery is removable, which means people can actually pull it inside and charge it. But that means it has to be safe. We've done some battery testing where you see a 4.3 battery blow up and it's much worse than you think. Like it can take down an entire house very quickly, right? So I think there's going to be regulation put in place to make sure that the batteries are safe and that the right access is provided, which I think is good. Yeah, by it. I test a lot of things. I've got like 30 e-bikes and e-scooters in our garage. Each of our garages between me and my business partner. And that is something that definitely stresses me out. But I, I think regulation will eventually come down on this. You're already seeing New York regulate it. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, the I love riding high-powered electric scooters that go 60 miles per hour, and most people wouldn't want to touch them. But there needs to be some type of regulation for licensing. And I see that kind of moving towards the future. And um, so a couple of things that were brought up were, well, I guess this isn't necessarily that was brought up, but it's it's 2023 and cancel culture is real, okay? So how how do you guys combat cancel culture that's going on? And not only just cancel culture, but the inability for most Americans to want to work on things. So I find I, we cover worldwide, globally with our channel, and I find the Asian consumers of EVs, they are willing to work on their EVs. American consumers, it's probably less than 20% that really want to work on their own EV. So how do you combat that and, and make it easier for people to want to work on it? Or I know we've talked about local dealers, but how does the consumer feel comfortable to work on it themselves? Yeah, it's, that's a hard one, right? Because it's, it's education. Um, if, if people don't have the knowledge, they're not going to do it, right? And, and it's complex enough that I think there are certain groups of people that will learn on them on their own, but we don't, we don't have the educational infrastructure in place to really train people. Most people have no idea what 
working on a battery really means, right? It's not just plug and play. There's so much, so many more safety aspects that go into it. So I, I think overall it's getting educational content out more and, and showing people what, what it's really all about. I think the, we've actually just been going through this whole debate internally in terms of what videos do we actually post on our website? Do we actually show people how to change the brake pads on their bikes? And this might not be very popular with the group here, but honestly, if you're coming to my website to figure out how to change brake pads on a bike, that is just a recipe for disaster. You know, that people have been doing this for decades. They're professionals. You know, I don't, I'm a pretty mechanical guy, but I don't change the brakes on my car. So why are we thinking of this as, you know, you know, as a cottage type of do it yourself type of thing. And, you know, quite frankly, I've put my foot down and said, no, we're not going to do that. You should be able to fix a flat, right? You should be able to adjust your derailleur. But when you start dealing with something that can cause life or death, why would you do that? Yeah, and so I, I agree with what you're saying there. And I think people can learn how to change brake pads, but it kind of opens up the door for liability issues is what you're touching base on. Is that if someone gets injured because they change their own brake pads, they want to attack the consumer or the, the manufacturer or the dealer. Same thing with the cancel culture that I was saying earlier was what I'm seeing in a lot of industries, they'll go to change their tire, they change it incorrectly, they pinch the tube, or they mess up the motor because they pull on the motor cable when they're trying to do a tire change. And then they start posting about how crappy this company is. You know, this thing sucks, this thing broke, but it was actually underneath their own um, trying to fix it that they caused these damages to the product. So that's what I'm kind of seeing in the industry, but. I know I kind of asked two questions last time, but how do you combat the cancel culture post and like what's going on in the community right now? I want to know the answer to that because I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've, that's a direct to consumer brand. This is like, you know, we, we were dealing this with this day one, right? Like God, you're selling, yeah, so selling direct. This is always a challenge. So, I mean, we've just found if there's someone that's really barking at us or really, you know, coming at us, you just, you go, you go back at them with kindness. You, you get, get on the phone with them. You talk to them. And oftentimes you can turn those really negative situations into really positive situations. When they get, get a phone call from the CEO that says, hey, let's talk about this. What's going on, right? And you go above and beyond to take care of that person. And then they end up becoming an advocate for you because they've had such a positive out-of-the-box experience. So really, like when we have those people that leave those crazy reviews or are coming at us, you know, as a CEO, I get on the phone and I just call them, right? And I just level with them as a person, you know, because it's super easy to sit behind a, you know, keyboard or a, you know, a text message and be someone. But when you get someone on the phone and you have a level conversation with them, oftentimes you can turn that into a positive experience. I like how he said most of the time. What I find really interesting is when you try to engage with a lot of these people, they won't pick up the phone and talk to you. They just want to sit behind a keyboard and throw darts at you. And you say, hey, can you give me your phone number and when I can actually reach you to have a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it goes blank. Yeah, so when we have customers like that, you know, we have a, we have a team of, you know, social media people that are, you know, they have a lot of expertise, uh, but they have the right attitude as well. And... We also take those conversations offline, so they're not, you know, in the thread. Um, and so I think when with that combination of I, I really know my shit, uh, and I'm being nice, and let's take it off Facebook, um, those things help. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I have spent nine years working in in software sales, so I talk to hundreds of people people like this. Um, and something that a mentor taught me when I was quite young in my sales career was what we're looking, what we're looking to do for customers is create wow moments. And those moments don't usually come when everything's going well. It comes when something's gone wrong and, you know, perhaps if it's someone, you know, practicing cancel culture, that's an extreme. Um, but 
if you can turn that situation around and create an advocate out of that person, that's your wow moment. Uh, taking a negative situation and, and turning it positive. And I agree that taking taking those conversations out of that public space, but publicly, you know, acknowledging that you will you will handle it, uh, I think is is key. What's your guys' take on the saying, the customer is always right? It doesn't exist in Europe. <laughs> um, I think they kind of are, right? I mean, if they're complaining about something, it's probably a, a reason for that, right? And and I, I agree with everyone here. We face this all the time as a motorcycle company or our product being a motorcycle. There's a lot of lashback on, oh, why is the range so crappy? Why is uh, why don't you have this kind of power? Why does it cost so much, right? There's there's a price disparity. So what I can say is I, I think focusing on what we're doing, focusing on our core customers, and then addressing the issues that they bring up is only good for us as a company. How, how else would you learn if you're not listening to your own customers? So there's things that we do that I, I think we're pushing and we could, we can ignore some things, but a lot of things people say are, are relevant. So I pay attention. Yeah. I also think it's about following the data. So I'm I'm a big believer in in data driven selling, um, leveraging the tools that are out there to inform your your decisions. So if you're receiving feedback, there should be you know a programmatic um, process or mechanism in place to catalog that feedback and when you're seeing trends, act on them quickly. If you don't have that that software in place or that that program in place to to catalog the feedback, it can be quite difficult, I think, um, particularly because you know the negative voices are always the loudest. Um, so you don't want to be jerking in different directions based on you know a couple of isolated incidents. But if you're tracking that data effectively, um, then that can really help you to build the the products that your customers want. And one other thing that I just add here is, you know, do the research on that customer that's flaming you out. You know, they have access to everything and you they can see everything that's coming at you. But you know what? You can do the same thing. You can see their their social media posts. You can see what's driving them and how their brain is working. And so you kind of can understand is this somebody a just has a habitual problem with everybody that they're dealing with, you approach that in one way. If it's somebody who doesn't tend to have a very high profile, um, you know, social media presence and is really seems to be having an issue, you handle it completely differently. So, you know, just use the technology both, you know, it, uh, it's a two way street. Yeah. Again, speaking from a direct to consumer standpoint, you know, we've had a lot of customers over the years and we're, we're, probably more on the liberal side when it comes to dealing with customer issues, but we do have boundaries and, you know, our customer service team needs to make sure that there are boundaries and then we're not getting pushed over on everything. Um, because there are those trolls as we like to call them, or those people that want to take advantage of a situation. And, you know, for us just making sure we have boundaries, but, you know, again, I go back to, you know, these customers, especially for us are our biggest advocates. So, Having a positive customer experience. I mean, the, the number that we use internally, it's 40% of our sales come from friends and family. So every one bike I sell, that customer, I can attribute 0.4 sales and it compounds. So, you know, we, we, that, that methodology leads us to having a much more liberal, you know, customer service process because, again, those are our advocates. Those are our biggest sales reps. But just one Quick bit of advice, you know, our, one of our social media team members, she's really, really good with people online. And I was like, wow, that person was really tough. How do, you know, how, how are you able to maintain your composure? And uh, her advice was talk to them as if they're your mother-in-law. That's the tone you should have. That's how respectful you should be. Even though you're upset, they're your mother-in-law. So, oh, I didn't realize you didn't understand that. Let me explain it again. So that, that was useful for me. So in the PV space, personal electric vehicle space, I find women are a little bit underserved in this market. They're not as 
they're a huge consumer, but they're not targeted as much. So in your marketing schemes, when you're going to retail, do you guys differentiate that marketing? And if so, what do you do to differentiate that? Well, I would say clearly you haven't seen our marketing. No, well, actually, so <laughs> the only person I thought was the exception to this was Turn because Turn is a lot of cargo, a lot of utility e-bikes, and I, I do believe that. So, but there's a lot of e-bike companies that make similar bikes that I find are not serving that community as much as they should be. Uh, just, you know, from our standpoint and our non-electric bike sales, we are pretty even. We're close to 50-50 men and women. And, uh, you know, I think we were th we were thinking about that, actually, as we were developing our product. And I think you come see our bikes. We're over on that far end of, of the building. But we have some very um, eclectic colors, right? And I think when thinking about design, we wanted to make not only the kind of what you see traditionally, very dark tone colors of bikes, we also have, you know, a couple bikes that have white rims and white tires and very color poppy sort of vibes to them because we believe that would appeal to men and women. So, you know, we, it's, it's always been in our bread and butter as a brand. And, and, and when we designed our electric bikes, we've got a very large spread of colors that I think are going to appeal to a much larger audience. This is, this is just unfortunately rare. Um, you look at the, the the split of men to women riders, it's still generally at about 25% women. Um, and speaking purely economically, that's a, it's a lot of money being left on the table as we know women have even more buying power um, or at least sway in buying decisions in, than men um, with about a $28 trillion um, uh, economic impact in the world. So if we're able to market to them effectively, I think that opens up a big, a big opportunity um, to bridge that gap, that 25%. Um, you know, I was actually just like last week looking at different bike brands as, as you do on like a, a Sunday, uh, scrolling through your phone. And I came across Ampler, it's this Estonia brand, brilliant. Uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a woman consumer myself, the homepage of their website is a blue bike, kind of akin to Tiffany Blue, and they play out this uh, scene, which is from the, th the beginning scene of Breakfast at Tiffany's, um, a movie that many of you may not know, um, but the women in the audience probably do, and it was subtle, um, and it spoke to, to me as a, as a woman consumer, and I was, I was much more intrigued to stop my scrolling of different bike brands and really dig into that, into that brand. Um, so I think it's those subtle marketing tactics uh, that really make a difference in um, in yeah getting in front of that that audience with so much so much buying power. Um, my my perspective is a little, a little different for uh, male versus female. I grew up in Vietnam. Right, motorcycling is is a male dominated thing here. It's not in Vietnam, right? Because it's a necessity. That's how you get around. So it's like, yeah, it's transportation. So it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a male, it, you ride a, a, a scooter or a motorcycle. And for us as a product, we're going to design the easiest product that you can get on two wheels with. Like that's, that's our whole goal is accessibility. And when you make a product that's accessible, it doesn't matter. People who want to do it will, will have better ways to do it, male or female. So we don't really try to target any particular group because that's very difficult to do correctly. Uh, we just target the most accessible product we can. I think that's a really good point, too, about where your market is, because in Europe, we were just at um, an event, um, Urban Mobility Days, um, in, in Sevilla a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about, um, some, some politicians on stage were talking about how only about 22% of the people working in mobility in Europe are women. So when you think about like mobility trends and the way people are getting around, um, the people making those decisions are, are generally men as well. So it's interesting to think about like, uh, you know, getting women into those roles and into, uh, you know, influential decision-making roles as it relates to the mobility of, of, of cities. Is here. Well, we're out of time and I want to thank everybody here on the panel for their amazing insight. 
I want to thank everybody in the crowd as well for coming and helping support the micro mobility movement. It's been awesome to be part of it. And it's great to see this grow from year to year.